Welcome to Unwarranted Music Opinions, the show with a theme song that thankfully will be ending soon. We know your pain. I feel your pain. It won't be this way forever. Just a few more episodes. I'm June Lindbergh here with Brian Courtney. Hello. And Chaz Jenkins. Look, the poor schmucks on Fiverr worked really hard to make that for me. Stop shitting on it. (laughs) And today's episode is themed. It's music from movie soundtracks taken out of context from the original screening and just put completely into musical form. So we have a pretty interesting little lineup today and I think we're getting things off with mine, aren't we? Yes. Perhaps. Yes. Alrighty. June, you get a minimum of three yawns. If I have to cut out more than that, I'm replacing you. (laughs) <laughs> finally <laughs> so I chose the 1965 recording for a Charlie Brown Christmas awful pick by the Vince Guaraldi trio how is this an awful pick it, I just Stop have so much line. problem with this <laughs> great album but why why do you have a problem with this? First off, it's technically a television special, so you've already failed the theme. Shut the fuck up. You've already no, failed okay. the theme. I watched this on It says on the VHS album cover. It says television my special. Childhood. It says television special on the fucking album cover. You failed no, the it theme. Doesn't. It says a Charlie Brown Christmas featuring the famous Peanut characters, original soundtrack, Vince Guaraldi. There's nothing that says television on it. I'm about to bonk Goddamn you so lunatic. fucking hard. Give me a second. I don't care what you think. I've watched it as a movie ever since I was like two years old, and that's what it goddamn is. <laughs> but anyways, Charlie Brown Christmas is a classic. A lot of people grew up with it. It's one of the few Christmas movies that still is enjoyable to watch as an adult. And one of the biggest reasons is Vince Guaraldi's wonderful cool jazz mostly piano led music he's got a very kind of bluesy a little bit playful but also melancholic style and while a lot of the songs here are traditional christmas music uh that was written maybe in the past few decades before this was released there's a lot of improvisation there are a lot of little licks that he throws in that are entirely his own not to mention the songs here that were also entirely his own like the completely legendary linus and lucy which is one of the probably most legendary piano jazz which has just become ever been conceived it's just become the peanuts theme at at this point like that song is the peanuts theme and you ask anybody and they'll say that shit's the peanuts theme like it's just canon now so for me the best thing about this album is Vince's piano playing, it adds so much personality and versatility to this collection of songs. And it's also his arrangements. While this album does have some classic Christmas songs, uh, even going back to, you know, the time of Beethoven, uh, about half or so of the tracks here are his own arrangements, his own uh, composings. Uh, compo- compo- compositions, <laughs> uh, including some of the most memorable tracks from here, Linus and Lucy, Christmas Time, Skating, that wonderful, just with the trilling uh, higher notes on the piano. For me, this is just a, a wonderful, wonderful piano jazz album. Despite it being so calm and quiet, there's so much life and bl- just energy to this that I love. But yeah, enough about me. What do you all think of a Charlie Brown Christmas? Well, first off, on Spotify, the album cover says the original soundtrack recording of the CBS television special. So fuck off with all that. Second, sounds pretty great. I mean, classic shit, classic G shit right here. You can never go wrong. I mean, Charlie Brown Christmas is one of the greatest Christmas films ever made. Now, the soundtrack, this is my first time just listening to the soundtrack. I'm just going to get this out of the way. This is a stigma that I kind of just hold against all three albums, regardless of how much I enjoy them or don't enjoy them. It's hard for me to 
not have the visual elements. There's something about with video game soundtracks that was a little easier about that, even though I made that point with a few of the picks, like even including mine, where I'm just going to play the game. I, I'm not going to listen to the soundtrack. I'm just going to play the game. And that's just kind of how I feel about all three of these picks. Because I've seen and love all three of the movies involved with these picks. So just kind of keep that in mind with my scoring and critiques. So Charlie Brown Christmas, super relaxing. I mean, the first note of the first song, and it's just like bliss, absolute bliss. It just hits different, you know? It's one of those albums, like when, when Christmas time is here, the instrumental kicks in. It's like, ah, like, oh. It, it, oh man, it's like chamomile punch, you know what I mean? It just fucking mm-hmm. knocks your ass out. A uh, beautiful live production. Uh, that's what struck me the first was like how the drums sound so live and the bass backing behind the piano, which takes the center stage. I mean, the piano playing here is amazing, but all the instruments sound great. I, I, at first, I was a little turned off by the bass just being directly behind my right ear, but it grew on me the more listens I had. So just something about it, like really, I don't know, everything just feels uh, like I'm just sitting between all instruments and they're kind of like pointed and like this trifecta, the drum, bass and, and piano, and I'm just sitting in between it all. But I love how the drums sound on this. Like when the drums kick in and all bomb, it, it, it just really, really like, I just fall in this world. It, it really makes me feel like a kid. This is one of those soundtracks that in this movie, like you said, June, I mean, all ages, it really is timeless. And I think that's what really sends it home for me is how timeless this sounds. I do have some issues with it, uh, but I'll get to those in a minute. The choir, the kid choir gives it so much character. I love just how <laughs> off key they sound sometimes. And like, it's just the cheap organ on Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And I mean, that scene in the film is one of the best movies, Christmas movie scenes ever. It's such a wonderful, wonderful film. Uh, and the jazz element, the cool jazz film. elements. He said it. Oh, my God. Debunked. <laughs> Suck a dick, bitch. Continue. My problems with it, I love this thing a lot. Uh, and a part of it's nostalgia. Part of it's just appreciation for the music. It's not – like, I know you're a score, June, because you've already, like, listened to this a bunch. It's not quite there for me yet because this is still a Christmas so it's always going to be like pinch and hold for me where I'm never going to listen to this except during Christmas time. I mean, that's just a fact. And, and it doesn't help that a majority of the songs on here, while beautifully arranged and amazingly played, are still Christmas songs. And I am one of those sticklers that just will not listen to Christmas music unless it's like November, December, you know, range outside of that. But I will say... Even in the middle of January, Christmas is well and done with. The first time I listened to this, I kind of fell back and was like, shit. I, like, like I just took a hit of a joint or something. I was like, fuck. You know what I mean? Um, the Fur Elise track just feels awkward. I know why it's there because of uh, Schroeder. You know, the whole, the scene where he's playing uh, for Lucy. And that, that's the classic scene about the Beethoven on the bubblegum card gag. In the album... It just feels weird and out of place because it has nothing to do with what the other songs are doing. However, it does transition amazingly into the closer, the Christmas song. I I like how that transitions into that. I mean, best songs by far are uh, Linus and Lucy, the the one-two punch of Christmas time is here, instrumental, and the kids. Hark the Herald Angels sing is a great moment. And of the Christmas songs, I love uh, My Little Drum. The, the thing is, like, I just remember all the scenes that these songs are associated with. And that's my thing with, maybe not so much with Brian's, uh, and I'll get into that in a minute, but with my album now You've pick, seen the thing, right? Not to derail, but you've seen yes, all these Yes, I've seen right? all three yeah. films and love all three films that we are going to talk about, which is why I was really excited about this theme. But I remember each scene that these songs are... So I'm just kind of torn there. Like, I need that visual element as well. But uh, I don't know. What do you think, Brian? I like it. It sound, it's really pleasant on the ears, produced nicely. I think I agree with June. I don't really – I agree with June in that the piano phrases are my favorite part in the piano playing. I don't necessarily see any of the melancholy in it personally. I think it's just uh, very relaxed, you know, mm-hmm. not like easy listening so I think much, that's because kind of, uh, 
I think that's because uh, Christmas time is here. That piano has kind of become synopsis for like just being a sad song. It's kind of a meme now where if something sad happens, you're going to hear. I I think that's just. I think the the melancholy might come from the movie, which is very. Have you seen the movie, Brian? No, this is the only movie that we uh, were talking about today. I hadn't seen. You've never seen a Charlie Brown Christmas? Really? It's a. very quiet and kind of subdued Christmas movie. I mean, there's a lot of scenes lot of where, where Charlie's just chilling in the snow and this music's playing and he's just kind of thinking, you know, that's a lot of the film. I mean, it really... Yeah, definitely a thinking movie. Uh, instead, it's kind of like a midlife crisis Christmas movie, even though Charlie Brown is a kid in, in it, apparently. <laughs> even though all of the characters in Peanuts are going to speak like they're adults when they're kids. That's just yeah. how it works. It's part of the charm, um, yeah. But yeah, like the movie is very quiet and subdued. And while it's funny, it's not like there's not really slapstick or anything like that. It's very witty. And I think the soundtrack reflects that really well. You might not get the sadness inherent in it unless you've seen the movie. For me, that comes through because I've seen it many, 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 many times. My mom makes us watch it every year. So yeah, that's where I get that from. I don't like uh, the background vocals on my little drums. That's my one. What? Half, I guess or the, the one part bum, I dislike. Diddy, bum, bum. Really? That shit's awesome. <laughs> Wasn't really into it. Wow. Nah, I didn't like it too much. This kind of got annoying. I, I didn't like them the first time, and I just didn't like them any time after either. And Linus and Lucy, like you all said, is like straight up classic shit. Like I like I. It's probably the best piano playing on here. Like my favorite song by a mile. And then I like the Christmas time is here vocal cut. Uh, more than the instrumental one, but both are really good. I wasn't crazy about Hark the Herald Angel Sings like you all were. Well, really. see, the problem is you don't have the, the vision. You haven't seen the movie, but that's like one of the most emotional parts. Well, of the yeah, because some of the associations with like parts in the movie, and you know, we'll get into this with the other ones, did it did enhance tracks for me, certain tracks around mm-hmm. the other stuff. I guess that's really it. I, I liked for release. I liked Christmas Song. I liked the Green Sleeves, like kind of bonus track, I guess it is. Uh it's a did you track. get green sleeves at the end of your? Uh, no, I made sure to not listen to that. I like. I just listened to the what was official. The I kept official it in. release. It's short enough. You know what I mean. I wasn't doing any harm by listening to it, so I gave it a go. It's pretty good. Great little piano jazz album. Piano is one of my favorite instruments in music in general. I love the way a good little rhythmic piano can add so much to like some of my favorite Bob Dylan tracks, or like when we listen to the Innocence Mission, uh, the piano part in Snow is like gorgeous. So I don't know. I mean, I I really like this thing quite a bit. I, I, it's just that uh. You know, not seeing the movie. We were just past the season, but, you know, it's still mm. cold outside. Might as well be Christmas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I liked it all right. June, like would you right. agree you that... Any, have, you have any closing thoughts? Would you agree, June, that oh, oh, Tannenbaum is the best of the Christmas cuts on here? I think that one is just so... Hits so hard. I think it is. It is. I would go Christmas time is here vocal. Well, that, that's, well that's an original. Uh, that's Vince's that's original. original. I'm talking about the mm. covers. I would go of, with that. that. I mean, the song has... Oh, oh, covers? Yeah, probably Tannenbaum. I mean, that I mean, shit, yeah, when he goes, covers. when it, like, picks up, when the drums kick in, I mean, that shit is, like, I see the movie immediately. Like, I'm just put into that world where Linus and... It's uh, such a good tone setter for the album. You know really what I mean? Is, when you're yeah. listening to it in this context. What child is this? I like my little drum. I think the vocals on that add so much to that track. It gives it a lot of character. Uh, what child is this is, is like, pretty good. I mean, I love... I, I like that song a lot. Yeah. Uh, what child is this? Skating is probably like the least interesting of what? the. What skating of, is wonderful. I mean, so I love them all. I mean, this it. is a classic, classic thing. But because Christmas is coming is great. Uh, I love Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I don't know. I but I'm obviously like the Peanuts classic shit here is like the best of the bunch. I mean, from Linus and you Lucy. Hit that T, man. You gotta hit the T in that word a little harder. I'm sorry. The Peanuts. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh. Linus coming out a little too quick is all. To Christmas time is here is like the best is like the and it's the, obviously the climax of the album. It's like right in the middle. It's the best part. I feel like we'll have more meat in the other discussions. This is why I wanted to start with this one. It, it's just classic G shit. Strong eight. I mean, I don't have that. It, it's not at that height status for me because it's still Christmassy. I still like to keep it to just that season. We're past that. Uh, but I mean, the playing here is great. The production is great. The emotion behind it and what it stands for and the movie behind it are all wonderful. I mean, you can never go wrong. I mean, it's one of the greats for a reason. I 
really, really, really love this thing. Uh, I could even listen to it outside of Christmas just because I think that the jazz improvisation here on display is fantastic. Just the arrangements, the piano playing, the warm sort of bittersweet phrasings that Vince uses are fantastic. But of course, as Chaz said, it's not like I'm going to throw this on in midsummer. It's, it's <laughs> Unless you're feeling musical. existential. That's crazy that you say midsummer because I almost picked the midsummer soundtrack for this. Unless you're feeling existential and you just put on a Christmas time is here instrumental. I don't think you're ever going to be listening to this in, in the midsummer. <laughs> I honestly rank this among some of my favorite jazz records of all time. I'm going with like a light to maybe decent nine on a Charlie Brown Christmas. I go with like a decent seven. I thought it was really good. The album I picked was the OST for the 1982 sci-fi horror flick, The Thing. So I want to give this movie a little background because obviously no one has ever heard of it on the internet. <laughs> and let me pull up the wiki. Hold on, I wasn't ready. <laughs> pull up this Wikipedia page. So I said it's uh, John Carpenter and Ennio Morricone, which might be the... He's Italian, so it's probably Morrisoni. Morrisoni, okay. Morricone, more Ennio nah, Morricone. I, I, this is racist now. You can't do that. No, nah, okay, that's so. probably how they pronounce it. Ravioli. All right. Now you made me be racist. It hurt you. John Carpenter, Ennio Morricone. That's how you say it. And he'll correct us if we're wrong. So... <laughs> 1982 sci-fi horror film universally panned when it came out. This thing was basically used as toilet paper by movie critics when it dropped. Dropped the same year as E.T., which is the only other alien movie that dropped that year that was worth the shit, according to everything I know about that year, which is that E.T. and the thing was released. So, great movie, fantastic movie. Visually, writing-wise, like it's just a, a great writing, great effects, really engaging. Has aged extremely well. Scary as shit. Um, as a sci-fi horror movie. Just tons of stunning moments in that film. Uh, and great acting. Just great everything. Great little movie. You should go watch it. You've seen it if you're here. Absolutely. Tell your friends to go watch it. Absolutely. One of the best remakes of all time so, as well. One of the, Do you mean the 2011 one or are you talking about the movie from no, 1982 the, being a remake of something older? In the back in the black and white. Oh, uh, the 2011 one's a fucking prequel. You're yeah, right. You're right. The 2011 one's a prequel. Film, it's not a remake. By the way. Piece of shit film, by the way. No, not the a f- good movie. It's okay. I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's just like the name association. You know what I mean? We're not here to talk about movies, though. We're not here to talk about movies. Though. Well, we kind of but are. I, you know, um, we're talking about their soundtracks. So the soundtrack to this movie is totally synth based, pretty much. No, like, no, it's a it's lot not. of synth horror. 80s it's stuff. like film classic. There's organ. I mean, there's organ and stuff. No, there's strings. It's a lot of classical. It's super classical, dude. It's it, like mostly strings. There's like are the strings not? Uh, no, they're all so are the string synth. arrangements. Okay, yeah, that I was gonna say that I thought they were synth. Cinematic no. classical. Um, this guy, Mr. Uh, Morricone. Ennio uh, is mostly I guess known that's for. Silly to think. Any of you film buffs he, out there? I mean, he was known for spaghetti western. Yeah. Good, Bad, and the Ugly, uh, Fistful of Dollars, classic shit as well. I mean, he's one of the greatest composers ever. I guess I just assumed it was all and had no idea. I don't know why I would make that leap. Had no idea he composed the soundtrack for this film. So that was pretty cool to find out. Well, I, he worked with John it. Carpenter on it. John Carpenter clearly has like a mind for the music in his films. You know, he understands kind of like, uh, I guess the other thing that comes to mind is like David Lynch, like understanding sound design. And how it can play into a film, but John Carpenter's is more music side. Like it's it's different from Lynch, but it, I, it, think of that first because that's another one where the sound stood out to me when I was watching. The music in this film doesn't stand out as much as the visuals or what's going on in it because it's just such a batshit crazy film in the terms of the events that take place. I would agree. But in listening to the music for it, it is very good music. It's really my favorite thing is how dynamic it is. Is how we get these huge string parts and these sometimes like organ really like gigantic comparatively to some of the quieter parts on the album organ themes and the kind of arpeggio synth parts like on contamination which has like the you know a bunch of synths it sounds like over top of each other and they're just those aren't synths those are strings those are just fairly dissonant strings oh i didn't know I, I, i was wrong about the sounds you're wrong about these sounds. It's got dissonant strings, as it turns out. Yeah. I'm being told. It, well, the first thing that I thought of when I heard that track, Contamination, I heard that and I was like, 
So that's where that X Files music stuff happens. So every time in the X Files, when something creepy shows up, it's gonna be that like, you know, get the your your yeah. hair sticking up, goosebumps. That yeah, that, like really weird and that track you really can't replicate it with your voice, but it. That yeah. track got me scared too. Like that that track scared me. Uh, bestiality scared me too. Uh, that 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 fucked me. Up. I was when that bass like it reminded me of Primus. It's like ball 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 ball. I was like, what the fuck is coming? Really, that me? one, that one to me is more like like the only scary one is contamination. I think that one is like you know what the hell is going on? And uh, I mean sterilization is a kind of scary as well but not in the same way no not in the same way that's the weakest track for me i think like that one? That yeah as no. far as i think this album is more ominous it's suspenseful it i think it's the most suspenseful yeah. thing very, we've ever listened very to suspenseful. yeah and what i think that it's able to why it's able to have that suspense uh is perfectly shown in humanity part one and part two where those songs are mostly just kind of oscillating between two chords. It's like a da na, but they both have kind uh, of. Uh, uh, they both right. have like breakout but moments in them as well, though. Exactly, that's what the suspense comes from because you're just waiting for something to happen. You're like, what is this building to? And it slowly builds, and they slowly change and just become more eerie and strange over the course of their about seven minute run times. And I think that that really is my favorite part of this record. Whenever there is just like this simple little composition, but it's just stretched out a little bit and made very ominous, very eerie, very, very atmospheric as well. So yeah, Wait is a track that's really, really atmospheric. And um, Humanity Part 1 is maybe the most atmospheric on it because it's the mo- it starts and like you said, it's just going between those two changes there's more to the track than that but it's kind of paid off by all that work they do before just staying patient with the composition so i've got a few things to say about this but first i want to give my thoughts love the film one of my favorite like horror films i mean like great acting as brian said great writing great like some of the best effects you'll ever see it's a fucking terrifying and balls to the walls film one of kurt russell's best as well he, he's amazing in it so now that i know that Ennio compose this that's some g shit too because he's one of my favorite composers in film i mean like fistful of dollars good bad and the ugly classic classic stuff we might do that if we do this theme again because that, that's some of my favorite mm-hmm. uh so the soundtrack on its own film score cinematic classical a lot of the strings obviously uh reminds me of like old films from the like 1950s Universal, where the strings are very dissonant and and creepy, uh, which makes sense because this is a remake of the 1951 original The Thing. But I think this is superior in every way, uh, personally. It's one of the best remakes ever, as I mentioned before. I didn't catch that quite, Chaz, that like the fact that it's the remake of the original 50s horror movie means that the soundtrack might be a little more inspired by that classical 50s yeah. horror rather than what was really big in the 80s at this point, exactly. which was the horror synth. However, there is still some horror synth element because, again, that's just part of the... And that's what just John Comfort is known for. He's one of the originators of that genre with the Halloween theme, as mm-hmm. Brian already mentioned. So let me get out of the way what I love about this because I do have some major critiques of this album, even though I do like it. The best parts are when the music truly is spine tingling. Like when it, when the music just goes beyond just kind of being creepy to truly like contamination, bestiality, humanity part two, some of the best tracks on here because it just goes beyond the music. Like I don't need the visual elements. My brain is doing that for me or I'm just creeped out wondering what's gonna pop up behind me and attack me. Uh, the more classical moments are kind of okay. Like they put me in the mood, but they don't really stand out to me. Like uh, Solitude or uh, Wait. I'm not a big fan of Wait. Uh, my least favorite track, unfortunately, is Sterilization. The Horacent Elements is very hit or miss here. When you have moments like Eternity or Humanity Part 2, I mean, good God, the Horacent utilization is amazing. Like the... 
like that comes in on eternity i mean that like beacon kind of that runs to eternity the whole track. is one of my favorite tracks here that for is the reasons you're saying it's so intense amazing amazing mm. and then humanity part two when it builds that huge crescendo moment like that one has like humanity part two is like the thesis statement for the record I feel like yeah it has this all this build well, and i love man when that fucking synth just plays it out it fades out and the right channel just has this super great bass note in it and then it just explodes. I yeah, mean, it's like yeah. an actually amazing piece of music on its own. Like, like huge, huge, huge highlight the, on this thing. Because the film is all about suspense. As It's a hugely suspenseful film, but it's all about paranoia. Because for those who don't know the plot of the thing, uh, this alien creature that can transform into, like take on appearance of anything, takes over one of the crew members. And then for the rest of the film, it's them trying to figure out essentially who's the fucking alien and then the aliens just picking them off one by one it's some of the best scenes are when they're just surrounding each other just kind of waiting for one of them to attack each other i mean the most iconic scene for the film is when they're testing each other's blood because that's how they figure out who they're going to figure out who the alien is that's one of the most iconic scenes from the film so this music is all about that however my reason why I don't like sterilization and, and some of the other tracks, like I said, some of them don't quite elevate for me. It's not like how Killer Clowns or Charlie Brown, where even without the visual element, I'm still put into the world. Uh, here, it does get a little generic at times. And for me, the horror synth, like I said, feels hit or miss because on one hand, where it's utilized perfectly, Humanity Part 2 or Eternity, it's utilized kind of wrong or, or kind of gimmicky in sterilization. To me, that track is too synthy. Like, the whole track is synthy. And to me, that feels like Ennio got his hands on a keyboard for the first time and just wants to go nuts with it. Uh, it really kind of takes me out of the, the atmosphere, uh, especially since this is a second to last track. It's a little disappointing. But uh, Despair is a great closer. Love that final note that hits. I mean, it, it like it's still such That's a... the one song... I recognize like that's the end scene of the movie where you know where I don't it pans out and it's showing everything yeah, right it pans yeah. out and it's showing everything at the end of the movie and it's I as it was playing I was like I remember this like I remember credits rolling over this like it, and it's such a great track as well and it really embodies its title too with the huge like you know yeah kind of uh what do you guys think I mean you, despair sounding sense wait what do you guys think about my critiques like uh I actually, I think I would mostly concur with what you're saying. Um, yeah, like I, I would say I mostly agree with what you're saying here. As a 45-ish minute album, I do think that... It slogs just a bit. Used, we could have used just a little something else, but of course this is a movie soundtrack and judging it as an album is a very difficult thing to do. And what we've tried to do with these... With, you know, with the video game soundtrack episode and the movie soundtrack episode is just to see if they work. Sometimes they do. Separate like album. The Charlie Brown music is elevated beyond just the movie. I feel like, but no one's pointing to the I Thane think... soundtrack as like, oh, that's the one you got to hear. Watch the fucking movie. Like, I feel like the this is one of those soundtracks that serves its purpose as a soundtrack. It reminds me a lot of uh, my feelings about this soundtrack are exactly my feelings about uh, the Last of Us soundtrack, where on its own it's like mm. and doesn't really like stick out to me that much, but in the game, you know, it elevates, does what a soundtrack's supposed to do. This one it's similar. It's similar. Like I'm never gonna pick any of these tracks out on their own. However, what elevates it just a little bit for me is the moments like Contamination or Bestiality or Eternity or Humanity Part 2 where like, it's like, whoa, now this is some like legitimately scary music like that's got me on my toes and like kind of peeking around the corner seeing if there's anything hiding in the shadows. I mean, it's great stuff. But I feel like I wouldn't call it an album of highlights because I think it is consistent enough, but I feel like just some of it just, like I feel like it slogs a little bit. Uh, some of the tracks just don't quite pop out of me as some others do and it just makes me want to watch the film like I, it, it, the, all three of these films i'm not gonna listen to the soundtrack i'm just gonna watch the movie because i love all three of these films right. very right. much i would agree with you honestly and i don't have much more to add beyond the fact that this is a really well made and suspenseful collection of tracks i do really enjoy the melding of the horror synths and the classical string arrangements here, I don't think it's something that you hear all that often outside of film soundtracks. This being one of probably one of the 
earliest, well, I don't know if it was one of the earliest movies to do it. Probably people were doing it in the 70s, but probably one of the most notable statements in that vein Mm -hmm. as far as music goes. I think as an album listen, it slogs a little, the pacing's a little off. As a soundtrack, and with some individual tracks here, like Humanity Parts 1 and 2, specifically those two tracks, honestly, it's really just a great selection of music, in my opinion. What about you, Brian? I think this made me appreciate the music more in the movie. Um, Just taking it as a separate piece, because the movie is one of those movies that's like just constructed so well in every aspect but to take the music separately which is maybe the aspect i cared about the least and to appreciate on its own was a really cool experience even like you know it's not as an album listening experience it's not designed for that this is literally released the tracks i like the way they ordered them if this was not the order they were used in the soundtrack maybe it just worked out but you know it's not in you know it's released like this because people want memorabilia for it or maybe they like the music in it and we're like oh i'll own that you know i would own this on vinyl for sure like if i had like you know if this were like a new movie or something i thought it was awesome i would get it well what's crazy um, to me is that this is one of the 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 examples that i was talking about earlier in the charlie brown one where i never really thought about the music in this i was just so enraptured by the visual element um, yeah, I mean, the movie's music is like still maybe it's like weakest element, but, but see, it's these, still awesome. These you know? songs, I can maybe remember the scene that they're affiliated with, but most of them I'm like, oh, where the fuck was this in the film? Like, I don't even remember this playing. Contamination is like the dog kennel, I think. Despair I think that's bestiality. I think bestiality humanity, is when the, when the dog's maybe, I think it could be. It could be bestiality, too. I know this, humanity part one is the... Uh, opening credits, right? With yeah. the shots of everything and like the opening shot of the ship crashing. Yeah. Um, that's that's humanity part one, like the dog running across. But but you know, there, there's very few moments where I can like re- like I don't remember the sterilization music going on in sterilization because there's so much more to take in. Yeah. Um, but and that's maybe that's it. why that song doesn't hit too well for me because like that scene is one of my favorite scenes, but I never think about the music. I think about the acting. The music is very the- much a backdrop for the scene. Yeah. Right. And, and the song itself, I mean, I kind of agree, isn't the best on the album. Like it's, it is kind of one of the slower ones in my opinion, even though I do still like some of the synth phrases they use on it. Mm-hmm. I think the fusion of synth and classical on here, I didn't even know it was classical at first, to be honest with you. I thought it was actually all like made using synthesizers, using like string settings and such, but well, that, um, it wouldn't like have existed. A, these strings sound too good for 1980s synthesizers. Yeah. Once we started talking about it, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I thought. I was like, yeah, I mean, they you wouldn't be able to get that kind of quality at that time. Once you all said it, it made sense. I just made that assumption in my head and never, I just never checked it again. And I was not just to mention it's to it. by one of the most notable composers in film scores ever. Yeah. I mean, I probably could have got it with like a quick Google search, you know, like, a, yeah. but I never looked into it. I just didn't look into it. So I'm feeling a light uh, seven, light seven. I, I think it's, it, it just elevates a little bit me. Cause I gave a uh, last of us a strong six. I think it elevates it just a little bit for me because of those tracks that just, make me like you know kind of like ball up and get a little freaked out because the last of us just kind of like eh, you know there's some cool stuff here but th- this one is just a little bit better than that i think so i'm gonna go with a light seven i'm gonna go with a decent seven because i think it's a really really strong selection of music i don't necessarily absolutely love and adore it by itself but there's songs here i sure do i think it's just great all around it has a couple weaknesses but it's still really really good film though Fucking 10. That is a great goddamn film. Watch that shit if you haven't already. Yeah, I'd echo the sentiments. Like a 7 on the album and a 10 on the movie. You know what I mean? I love that fucking movie. So the album I picked is the original soundtrack for one of my favorite movies of all time. Killer Clowns from Outer Space. B-movie legend. Killer Clowns from Outer Space came out. This is the B-horror movie. I mean, it's technically a parody of B-horror films, but it's like the... When you think of B films, this is like the big one. I mean, and I feel is like that. parody? I think it is. I call it a parody. It's not a parody. It's not a direct parody, but it's a cheesy B horror movie. But the right? thing is. So it's a novel idea. I don't think there's been a lot of like clown, evil clown. But maybe there have been. Maybe they saw it and were like, let's make one where there's a bunch of clowns. I wouldn't call it a parody, but I definitely would call it, you know, it's a B movie. All the way is an 80s horror B movie. It's one of the best. It's one of my favorite films. Uh, Came out in 1988. So the soundtrack 
composed by our boy John Massery. I think that's how you say it. Uh, that's no, the thing with these. Masari. Masari. Okay, that probably that sounds be- more correct. Probably. The problem is when we do these soundtracks, yep. we're, we're gonna have getting names wrong, man. That's the problem with these soundtrack themes. We so many awful names to figure out how to pronounce awful anyway. names he said it so this soundtrack is the original soundtrack uh recorded in 1988 released in 2006 uh because around that time is when the film started getting more of a cult following when it came out i think people it got some notoriety from some people but it didn't really start getting into that ele- like because now that's such a household name like everybody knows the film and in its existence so I can see why they released the soundtrack for it later, like decades later. I wanted to pick this because I love this film so much. And I think this talking about the soundtrack would be interesting. And I think listening to it, I think we can all agree it's very it's a very interesting listen. Uh, it's the longest of the picks here uh, with a clock in time of 67 minutes. A lot to take in here. A lot of tracks. Film score, you know, a huge horror synth here. While there's elements of horror synth in the thing, this is pure horror synth. All synth. Everything is synthesized here, and there's some and there's circus carnival music. Yeah, circus march. Well. Yeah, because it's clowns. You know, gotta have the carnival. Well, there are two exceptions to the synth thing, which is uh, the, the Dickies opener title track, the opener and the closer. And yeah, the Dickies title track, which is like super famous for with this movie. I've remembered that shit since childhood. Like yeah. I've seen that movie has been around with me that long, and I still remember the hook on that song to this day. It's amazing. Before I ever listen to this thing. I'll get my thoughts on it later because I have a, uh, I have some things I want to say about it. But I'm really curious what you all think. Uh, I know Brian's seen the movie in June, at least knows the film. But this one will be fun. <laughs> so what do you all think? So I love this movie. June hasn't seen it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go first on the album. Okay, it's too long. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's too long. it is. Uh, it, I don't it's think it's definitely slogs. too long. I don't think and it's slogs that and, bad, though. I actually think it, the pacing of it's pretty decent, uh, personally. I think it slogs pretty hard, but that's probably my biggest complaint. The okay. music here is mo- is mostly fine. The best tracks are the ones that go along with like key scenes in the movie. Shadow Puppets, Visits the Drugstore. Killer Clown uh, the March. The best track, which yeah. is uh, Killer Clown March, which is the, you know kind of iconic to me as well like burnt burner you know it's like this really janky well then you have that uh uh, like guitar part you have that like survivor eye of the tiger like chugging like coming in that that is amazing yeah the best part of the album is the amusement park death pies which is as first as its own composition but then juts into the killer clown march but something about the way it changes and something about the way it's played plus the scene that's maybe my favorite scene in the whole movie uh-huh. my one hang up it's not a hang up i just wish like the vocal snippets were here just because i love them so well, much there's so many quotables that Brian, i wish kind of made it onto the record to when we talked the about the parappa the rapper soundtrack you said the exact opposite you were like i don't think having the dialogue over this music would elevate it any but here you're saying it, it would what the fuck because that's Parappa the Rapper, and this is Killer Clown. Kill <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's just like that thing where I didn't play Parappa, so I didn't have any affection for the game. So I'm just kind of going in blind, to, you know. Um, but with this, you know, there's background. I like there's, that it's they, just they, the music. I'm if biased. I, I like that it's just the music because I know that film so fucking well. I know where every scene, and it helps with the track titles, obviously. But I know every fucking scene that these songs are associated with. Like this is one of my favorites. Shadow Show was the one that I recognized the music from the most. Where you know the the clowns on the side of the street doing a shadow puppet show, and he can make like ridiculous things like a dinosaur, and they're huge, and they like eats all the people. Mm-hmm. That scene's awesome. Um, okay, so there are a lot of tracks on here that uh, just, for lack of a better term, just like miss, like are just total, you know, just don't really do anything, don't stand out compared to the other ones. Like it's basically this song's really good, and this song is just kind of boring top of the world and uh muscle clown car you know that whole segment of the album i think the problem is that really weak it's very samey i think the compositions though that are great i really like the compositions i think the instrumentation just stutters a bit but there are some moments where like it truly sounds video like 90s video gamey like there's one synth part in one of the tracks that dead ass sounds like Super Mario 64, the boom, boom, like that comes, like it legitimately sounds like the fucking same kind of synth tone, you know, whatever you call that shit. But I get what you're saying. There, there are just tons of tracks that don't, like, kind of don't matter. Like, I, I don't know how else to say it. Like, Debbie's been caught. 
but Funhouse Part One and Part Two, which kind of sucks because those are pretty long songs uh, compared to the rest of the record. It looked, I think, Funhouse Part Two is the longest song, and that one is like just nothing happening on it that keeps me interested. It sounds like just a bunch of parts arranged around scenes in the movie that doesn't translate at all to like being a track. Mm -hmm. Uh, The same goes for um, Mike and Debbie's discovery, which is like the most, it jumps around the most on the album. You have this really nice kind of like space intro. Like it sounds like kind of space themed uh, in its tones. Kind of hard. It may be hard to explain that because we're just getting the sound, but it's kind of like, robotic spaceship like button noises i guess is how i would describe it but then you get later on this like music that's them used for them sneaking around and it's not as engaging and by the time the track gets to the end of it i'm done like it's them escaping so the music kind of picks up or whatever but it's just so disjointed and so messy in arrangement that i can't bring myself to enjoy it that that actually is the longest song here like seven minutes and it's it sounds like three different songs, but it's all used for one scene, so it's kind of all put here. And towards the beginning of the movie, the scene is, you know, they get onto the ship. It's like them getting, seeing the huge ship, which is a big carnival tent, by the way. It was awesome. <laughs> and then they go inside and see all the horrible shit that's going on, and then the escape where the clowns get out into the city. That's all contained in this track, and all the musical arrangements in the track for those moments are very different and arranged reasonably so for the scene and not for the, really the listening to it. So that track is a really hard one to get into after the first track. So the Dickies uh, original song for this movie is awesome. It's just a Amazing. really weird carnival, like rock banger basically. And has like the amazing hook. Like, the, Clown. the back, it's totally of, cheesy. The backup vocals Amazing. Like, on it, that track are it's really fucking it is. killer yeah. clowns. Awesome. Fucking it's, awesome. It's great. It's just a perfect song for this movie. Cause this movie is like B horror movie is like, you know, not a not a huge budget, but there are some great effects in this movie. Not to derail and talk about the movie. You know, it's just such a memorable movie, and some of the tracks here are really memorable, but like half or more aren't, to be honest. And, and so that sucks. It really is an album of highlights. And weirdly, normally I'm all about the longer. I don't like the shorter stuff, like the shorter kind of just moments on albums like these when we've done soundtracks before. Forget about it. The best tracks here are like the Killer Clown March, Amusement Park, uh, and like Death Pies. That that one is so fucking great. I don't know what it is about the transition into Killer Clown March from just like this little synth piece. I think it's maybe because they tease it a little bit, like halfway through the track, and it's like burn, burn it, and they're just playing like little guitar snippets from it, and well, it a- kicks in. It actually goes so fucking hard. Well, like that the it's best like, moments. It's, it's a little. I don't want to throw around the word transportative because we use that a lot <laughs> here. But like, it's. I can see that scene happening. The end is weak too. The end of the album is so weak. I actually don't like the escape from Clown Cathedral confrontation. But the track titles are really good. Is <laughs> one thing I guess I should say. And Truck Escape and Clownzilla, all super great weak. climax. And then you just but, have like yeah. It's not really that engaging. Well, it doesn't pay off the previous 50 or 60 minutes. While I don't mirror your your complaints, I understand where you're coming from because that's such a great climax where Clownzilla, this giant fucking clown, attacks them and all that music is happening. The music, the music does not do it justice. That scene is way better than this music could make yeah. you think it is. I will say the post-grunge cover at the end or remix what a surprise. post-grunge remix what a surprise so, <laughs> i love the like butt rock melody going on here like with the guy's voice is like we're your so, boy like so i don't know what he's fucking better. saying so eddie oh better. dude it's like he heard eddie that's every fucking butt rock or post-grunge group it's like oh i love eddie better and they just do that and like not realizing everything else that probably made it good. It's I love honestly people one of the just best. Just take po- something <laughs> and remove context and just take the things that they, the first thing they see or hear that they like, don't dig any deeper, copy and paste it. But they all, I bet they own the same shirt 10 times. That's that kind of person <laughs> who wrote this song or sung for it. Maybe they knew though, because it's kind of awesome too, though. This is maybe the best post so, song I've ever heard. Yeah. So me and me, June and Brian had a bit of a spat in Discord about this track. On Rate Your Music, it says recorded in 1998. Now, I had a bit of an existential crisis because, like, well, hold on. When did grunge start picking up? So then I, like, did some research. Like, so the Melvins, like, so I was like, well, well this was recorded. The Melvins debut had just dropped. No, I'm, 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 let me finish. Let me fucking finish. June. Let me fucking finish. I was like, well, 
I was like looking when these Let like, him bands, prove how stupid he is. I was like looking when these bands were like coming out. I was like, well, this came out around the same time. So maybe it was ahead of its time. But the, but then they said post grunge. So I was like, shit, it's got the Eddie Vedder. The the production's too clean. I was like, Chaz, it's from the 2000s. It's after grunge. Well, like, it it's came, not- it was recorded in 1988. You know, so no, not, not this song, dude. Not this song. The rest of the when the the rest of the soundtrack when the movie came out, yes, the post grunge song released as a bonus track on the CD release in the two thousands when the movie was notable enough to be pressed to CD, which is insanely cheap. That's how long it took. And CDs were all around, by the so, way, when the movie came out. So, so to mess with Jude no, and Brian, so to everything much, you're saying. To mess with Jude and Brian, in my canon, it was recorded around 1988 because that's just how fucking hilarious. Because it bothers them. I'm not letting you fall down this conspiracy rabbit hole. We've seen <laughs> where this shit goes. It's not funny anymore. You're not allowed to be wrong because it's a meme. You're eventually just going to be wrong because you're fucking stupid. <laughs> I will not let you spiral. You're going to start bringing fucking Burzum albums to the show, and you're going to be like, I don't, you know, I don't agree with him, but you know, fucking, I wanted to let's talk about it. Let's just talk about it. The Meat Man? I'm only bringing up his ideology. The, the, the Meat Man? You know, it's not I that give him, We're not giving this shit airtime. I want you to censor his name, or their name. I don't even know. I'm not even going to gender that person. Just fucking... <laughs> There's no you one. Were okay. I was with you at first, but now you're just going <laughs> off on I don't even know what. June, I, what? June, what do you think? I don't even know what you're saying anymore. I think I've lost the plot. <laughs> <laughs> I mostly agree with Brian, but I don't think I'm as harsh on it as he is. Wow, I don't really okay. feel like there's ever any track that bore me to tears or anything like that. I mean, I do think that it's an hour long and that it slogs quite a bit and that it's not really formatted as a record however shocking this is very different than the things soundtrack there's elements of horror synth on both but the thing was slow and suspenseful and paranoid while this thing has 90 degree turns 180 degree turns throws you into a brick wall and it goes at a thousand miles an hour for a great deal of sound of the time here. There's no darker or more ambient songs, but then you'll have a clown explosion happen so I, in the middle I, of one. I would like to shout out one track that is maybe in that vein, and that's uh it's not Officer Mooney, it's Ventriloquist Mooney. Ventriloquist Creepiest Mooney is the song. only track on here. I thought that was kind of like actually pretty scary. Well, the that's the scary scary too. That's like the said, scariest the scene in the here. film. That's the scariest scene in the film, is exactly. It? The best tracks are next to the best scenes. I feel like they really, there was a good meld there with that. Not to cut you off, June, but to talk about that track in particular. And I, I love the uh, Death by Pies track. Hell I don't yeah. know what it's called. Amusement but that's Park. A, Death Pies. Amusement, amusement Park slash Death Pies is great. It's I think it's mostly a rendition of the Killer Clown March. March. It is. But, but it's done a little differently and it's just so upbeat and insane. The Killer Clown March is great too, just in general. I really, really liked this. I didn't love it, uh, but it was super fun. Am I going to come back to it? No, because it's an hour long. But will I come back to like the Dickies doing the theme song, the super cheesy 80s new wave horror theme? Sure, I will. Will I come back to maybe the post grunge? You know, yes. No. Absolutely. Um, like, did like, you not like the? the part, did you maybe, not like the closer? You know, perhaps. I know. Of course, I don't like the closer. It's okay I mean, to like it's some a novelty track. It's, it's okay it's, it's to like, like some okay, post grunge like, June. There's some good post grunge out there. Like any genre. Not that I've heard. Well, let's see. The best post grunge is probably Foo Fighters. Did not know they were post grunge. I would not associate them with like any like the shit that like Creed or or. I think, I think Foo Fighters are boring as shit. Yeah, because you're a bastard. <laughs> wow. Um, Color and shape yeah, is awesome. Color and shape a, is amazing. <laughs> We're not talking about Foo Fighters. I'm talking about Foo Fighters now because I love that band. Tom would agree with me. <laughs> oh, God. I don't think Tom would. I don't think Tom Hummer would agree with that. He might, though. He kind of was sus with the What Tyler thing. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I would go with like a... Oh, I'm going to go with like a strong six to a... Strong six. I, I'm just going to sit at a strong six. Nice. I love some of the tracks. I really do. But as a listening experience, not great. I, nostalgia and actually good songs that are kind of scattered throughout pretty much carried this thing for me. 
if I had never seen this movie, I probably would have hated this. Like, honestly, because I can't. But like being able to tie it to the movie uh, that I've seen was a big part of enjoying this one for sure. Um, because there is a lot of stuff that doesn't really work to me is like just listening to it as a song or as an arrangement even. And it's just really, really long and a big slog. But gr- some great stuff on here, honestly, like for fans, I think. I don't know if you could enjoy this in a vacuum. I'm surprised June did, honestly. I haven't seen this movie. Uh, I mean, I've watched the synopsis of it. I'm going to give it a light seven. Yeah, let's fucking go. Because awesome. I'm stronger than you. That's like a Brian. stone's throw for me, though. Like, I'm just kind of, I, I, you know, it's good. So it's because I am stronger. Than well, you. I don't agree. I know exactly it's, where you're, where you all come from with your complaints. I love this fucking guys movie. About to give this shit a nine. And I, the soundtrack did not disappoint. Uh, while I agree that some of the instrumentation is pretty samey, I do really like a lot of the compositions here that keep me invested for this lengthy runtime, which is hard to do. It didn't slog for me at all, and maybe that's just because. Every song, oh, no, that scene. So then the scene's just running in my head, and then I'm on to the next track. It, it really uh, didn't bug me that much, uh, even though I do agree it is a lengthy listen. Uh, the production's great. I love how these synths sound. Like I said, some of it just gets really video gamey to the point where it's like, this is kind of ahead of its time. Like, honest to God, it, it's kind of amazing. Uh, yes, the, okay, good thing, Chad. Yep, sure, buddy. The, the, the opener and closer, bangers, love that shit. The, like, oh, so much. Genuinely some creepy Which one do you prefer? Too. The opener. Which one uh, do you prefer? Of course, the Dude, opener. Dude, okay, just making sure. I'm just making sure. <laughs> There's genuinely some creepy moments, too, for such a silly film. I think some of the songs do get genuinely creepy, like Venture Lucas Mooney was a perfect example that Brian mentioned. And overall, I, I just love this thing. But like Parappa the Rappa, Video game or movie, I'm just going to go to the medium. I'm going to watch this fucking movie. I'm not going to listen to the soundtrack. However, I think it's better than their Parappa the Rappa soundtrack. So I'm going to go with a light eight. All right. B- lightning round. Which clown are you? B- uh, so me and my brother would roast each other all the time when I wear this. And he would always say, I'm this one with a big ass forehead. That one? And I would always say, and I would, I would always say uh, you're this one with this. Triple chin going on, motherfucker. That one is literally called Fatso. That clown is called Fatso. <laughs> so which one is this one? Which one is I don't know. One? I'm trying to find it. So that one has like the He's the Shadow Puppet one and the and the clown car one. Where I think Fatso is not Fatso Fatso's Shadow Puppet or is he in the drugstore? No, like I think he's the drugstore. Am, this... I, am I one of the female clowns that seduces the humans and, and Yeah, the yeah. With the, oh, where their yeah, tits yeah. just go. You're one of those. Where their tits just go. You're the they're uh they're credited as female killer clowns, so there you go. There you go. They don't even get a name. <laughs> Sexist pigs. I'm gonna be Bibbo because I don't know who he is, but that's fucking hilarious. No, no, Brian, Brian, you're the most famous clown. The one that like is associated with the film, but he's not on this fucking shirt because his shirt's enormous. The baby one, right? The baby yeah, clown. What's the his one name? that that knocks his block off? That's you. That you're the is knock. That, who is that? Shorty. You're Shorty. Shorty. You're Shorty. I'll be Brian. Shorty. Yeah. He is iconic, isn't he? Look at him. Yeah. I'm trying to find the one. I was gonna say you were spiky, Chaz, just because. Oh, is this one? I mean, this one? Yeah, he's a, he's a little bit ridiculous, but also kind of a Chad. Like, <laughs> he just, it's like, man, he looks kind of. It's like having a mullet. It's like, why would you have a mullet? But that I respect you. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so next time is our final episode before our big rankings. Uh, this our season favorite two. Season yeah, two. Season. How how long have we been doing this? Two seasons. Thank you. So we're going to end this season uh, before our ranking episode, which is like the main event of, of the whole show. Uh, we're going to keep it topical, uh, too, with an album release <laughs> last year. <laughs> New albums. Uh, technically, albums from 2020. At this point, this is going to change where we're just going to do new releases. Doesn't like as long as they're in like a certain release timeline that that's new enough is when we're going to do them. So I have my pick, but I'm going to save it for last. So uh so next week for the final episode, I was struggling. I was thinking about picking Chris Stapleton, the new Chris Stapleton, because contemporary country we haven't really talked about, and it's getting a lot of praise. I hadn't heard it, so I think it would would have been cool to check out. I thought about uh, using our new albums work as sequels, like that kind of loophole we have for clipping. But then I just realized that that would – I realized we hadn't talked about someone that I meant to get to on this season yet, and I don't really see – this album is a bad place to start necessarily. I don't see it as completely different from what they were doing before. So 
even though it's not the one I would have loved to start with, I think it's time. It's just time. And I haven't heard it either, and I need to get to it. We're going to do Dorian Electra. Haven't, haven't heard it. We're going to do oh. Dorian Electra's My Agenda. So I decided to pick a record that I have not heard yet, even though I've already put out like a top 30 of the year. There's still albums I haven't heard. I haven't been able to get to everything. And I looked up and Manger on McNichols by Boldy James and Sterling Tolls. Uh, looking at the genre tags here, we got jazz rap. We got conscious hip hop. We got experimental hip hop. There was, jazz. Yeah, so there was a lot be, of good hip hop this year that got released. This was one of them. Was kinda, really this was later in the year. This one really came along. Like there were a lot of YouTube talking heads like Dead in Hip Hop, of course. Sean C, you know, everyone you see who you get on your recommendations if you're on music YouTube. Uh, I mean, they all love this shit. So I, I was, it was on my list anyway. And I've been listening this year when I'm not listening to new stuff. It's been a lot of hip hop and a lot of jazz for me this year. So this goes hand in hand with those two things. I've been, we've been talking about wanting to talk about hip hop and jazz more. I feel like this is just the perfect storm. So I'm really excited to hear it because I, it just kind of slipped through the cracks. I didn't get a chance to check it out. I barely recognize that it existed, but now that I'm looking at it, I'm really excited to give it a shot. <laughs> this, uh... yeah. So this is just to hurt you guys. Uh, all the other times were just accidental, uh, not meant to be. Uh, this one, I'm just, it's for all the gags, all the goofs, all the memes. Back in episode three of season one, uh, I picked an album of a... Literally, episode three of season one, over two years ago. Yeah, I picked a little album from this, you know, bedroom pop, indie pop, tweet pop group. Thought it would be fun. I uh, thought June might get a kick out of it. Thought Brian might like some of it. Became one of the most dogged on, shit on, memed picks of the entire show. To this day, nothing it has ever It still is. It's still one of your worst picks. <laughs> it's still worse than some of the bad stuff you picked this time. <laughs> Which is hilarious. And, you know, I was... We never planned to do this show again. So here we come around 2020. Our boy and girl duo Diet Sig released their second album. Hell yes. <laughs> so we're going to do their second release. Do you wonder about me? Pretty much the same genre tags as the first one. I was I was like, I can't imagine it's any fucking different. <laughs> I'm worried about this, though, because the person that got me on a Diet Sig loved the first one. Wasn't that hot on this one. So, which, in the way the fate works, that means you guys will like this more, you know, given how that, you know, fate usually works like that. Uh, I, have I, I have no, like, predictions. I'm just going to... I, Cause I've never heard this, uh, you know, I've even grown off of the, of the debut, like a lot. Oh, whoa. Word. Yeah. Oh, word. I've grown off of it. Damn. Bit. You must, uh, you must have heard it more or something, dude. <laughs> well, no, I saw them live and I've got a story that I'm going to tell. June's heard this. You story. told us that story. Yeah. But that I never, story, how did, story? I've never how said did that it, story. Oh, I've never I remember, said it in an episode. I've never said it in an episode. So that I'll, I'll, I'll for the record. Yeah. I've never they said it malicious or anything. Yeah, they weren't yeah. malicious to you or yeah. me. It was, it's different thing. So no one got hurt. No one got hurt. Who knows how this is going to go down? You guys might love it. You guys might hate it. Like everyone's expecting you to. Who fucking knows? We I'm just excited. You know, we might love it. It's a possibility. There's a chance. We might love that it. Ever, the, the planets might align. You know, I'm just mm -hmm. excited to talk about Maybe. this band again because that Take meme, that meme has just transcended the show of just the hate for diet sake. So who knows? But I feel like this is the perfect way to end this season. You know. All right, Chaz. Here's the deal. If mine and June's collective score does not add up to at least a seven. It has to be a seven or higher. Okay. You can't ever pick them again. Okay. All right. <laughs> Bet. Right here, we right now. Ban this band. Have, it has to be... Like, it has to be my, has her to score. Forward. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. It, it has to be her score plus my score. And it has to equal seven. Okay. Now, or don't more. let that... Yeah. Don't let that expectation, like, go in... You know, open mind, all, like always. Oh, no. I mean, I'm going in with an open mind because I remember there were things I appreciated about the first record, even though I hated most of it. <laughs> uh, 
I'm really curious of how this is going to go with and Brian I'm because thinking, Brian. I'm looking at this and I'm like, that was my first one I ever got from Brian was Diet Sick. Like he fucking hates. To be fair, I'm pretty over the top. Like I, I, I don't quietly shit on things. Like I'm probably go. I probably go too hard. I think you could say. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't care. That shit so, was miserable to fucking listen to. I'm really so curious how this is going to go. I'm really curious how this is going to go. So we'll see. Uh, I'm worried because we've already listened to the better version of this with Beach Bunny. I straight up don't like the foreshadowing of like, yeah, my buddy who recommended me this didn't like the second one. Although. <laughs> That's <laughs> such a bad sign. That I know. such a bad but, sign. But the way this show works means that you guys will like it because he liked the first one. You guys absolutely hate it. So the way that, you know, Chakra works or some shit like that. Who is this buddy? Who is the, who the fuck is this? It's not a buddy. Tolton or something. Like, don't fucking... no, <laughs> no, it's a YouTuber I, I watch. <laughs> It's a YouTuber. I want. Oh, okay. Shout out to Crash Thompson, the rock critic. Some of my picks came from him for the show. Were any of them good? Yeah. And he was a huge Weezer. Diet Sick was Lord. not. Uh, well, I don't want to get into that now. We're wrapping up. Well, I'll, I'll tell you all later. I know. I just want to know. We'll I just want to know. Up and we'll talk about yeah, it. we'll yeah, wrap yeah. up. And this talk has about been on more music opinions. I'm June Lindberg here with Brian Courtney. Mm, I don't have a clever outro. I'm Brian Courtney. And Chaz Jenkins. Apricots. We'll be back next time. Apricots.